and uh, the Lord's led us to the book of Exodus. We've done Genesis. I don't think I've ever done Exodus. I think it's time that we do this. The second book in our Bible, uh, in the Jewish Bible, it's called Shemot, which means names. And it gets that title from the first verse. And these are the names of the children of Israel. However, 70 Jewish scholars translated the Old Testament into the trade language of their day, into Greek. And uh, it is called the Septuagint for the 70. It's called the Septuagint. And the Septuagint calls this book Echodos, or we get the English word Exodus from it. And that word means way out, because this book tells the story of Israel being brought out of Egypt, out of Egyptian bondage, and then being brought into really a redeemed relationship with the Lord. And that relationship is expressed in worship of him, in fellowship with him, and of course, of service to him. The book reveals to us that and this is important, folks, that only redeemed people can have a relationship with God. Only a people that God has redeemed can have a genuine relationship with God. And uh, that continuing fellowship with him is really the goal. But it's only possible God's way. That is through the redemption that he uh, provides. Exodus is a record of God birthing the nation of Israel and then covenanting with them, making them his very own people. The events in the book of Exodus, they, of course, begin with Israel in Egypt to Israel at the Red Sea and then crossing the Red Sea, uh, Egypt in the Sinai Desert. And uh, I think perhaps we should be reminded of the last verse of Genesis. And the last verse of Genesis says something to this effect, that uh, Joseph, who was like the prime minister of Egypt at that time, Joseph, that son of Jacob, that son of Israel, that uh, Joseph was buried in a coffin in Egypt. What a ominous ending to the book of Genesis. We leave Genesis with really a thought about the effects of human sin. The effects of human sin results in death. So Joseph is in a coffin in Egypt, last verse of uh, Genesis chapter 50. Exodus, the book of Exodus is really God's answer to that. It is God at work to redeem humanity. And if you want to understand the book of Exodus, there are four significant events of Hebrew history that are recorded in this book that really illustrate how God forms a redemptive relationship with human beings and uh, uh, how he initiates it and forms this kind of thing. I'm going to share those with you in a moment, but I was thinking about the verse that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning already, how that uh, what Israel was like in the wilderness, and then how Paul says all these things happened unto them, for examples, they're written for our admonition, for our warning us upon whom the ends of the world have come. These four significant events recorded in the book of Exodus really give us a bird's eye view, a panorama of the book of Exodus. And the first one is the Passover. The second one is the Red Sea crossing. The third one is the uh, law giving. 
And the last one is the building of the tabernacle, the construction of those are the four significant events that really are played out in the book of Exodus. I want to give you that, that up front. I want to pause a moment, look to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we want to briefly touch on each of these four, and then we'll be done. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to be together and to worship you. Lord, you're good, and uh, you desire to have a real living relationship with us. Lord, we can't understand that. It's just all of your grace. It's just overwhelming to us to think about it. But we are so grateful this morning for the way that you have dealt with Israel. As we already have heard, you have hidden your face from them and are at this very moment. But it's just a brief moment compared to the everlasting mercy that you have uh, covenanted with them and uh, they will experience yet in the future as a nation. We're praising you that uh, you are in the business of calling out a people to your name. That's what the church is, made up of Jew and Gentile, one body, one people, your tabernacle, and Lord, we pray today that you might use just this intro into this book of Exodus to stir our hearts and to uh, begin to make of us more and more the, the people that you want us to be. If there be any that aren't in a saving relationship with you today, may this be the day in which they're born again. That relationship is initiated. It begins. And then those of us that are already your people, Lord, may that relationship with you be enhanced and uh, may it uh, continue to grow. And may we, like the psalmist in the song we sang, not be satisfied until we awaken your likeness. And we'll just thank you for it in Jesus' name. So let's talk about the Passover. Really, I, I'm, I'm breaking this up. The, the book of Exodus is 40 chapters. So I'm saying the first 14 chapters really are leading up and, and include the Passover. Israel's exodus out of Egypt. That's what the Passover really is significant of. And you know what is, there, there's an irony here. You have to know that 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 God, he is uh, he has a sense of humor. Because look at the irony you as you uh, open the book of Exodus. It begins with a baby story, like baby stories. It begins with a baby story, a baby that was born under a death sentence, and yet this baby's life. I'm thinking of Moses. This baby's life is remarkably spared by God's intervention upon it. And there is an ironic twist. Not only is this baby's life saved, not only is he, is he rescued from death, but it ends up that his own mother cares for him for his first few years. And then he becomes the king's foster son, with all the privileges, with all the advantages of being a prince. I mean, he gets the best Egyptian education possible. He lives a life of luxury. The rest of the Jewish people, the, the Hebrew people, they're in slavery. He's living in luxury as the, daughter, as the, uh, the king's daughter's son. Then... When he's 40 years old, he gets a sense that he is God's deliverer for Egypt. It comes to him. And the Bible says that uh, he tried it out. He tried to be Israel's deliverer. And you know what he learned? 
And this is a vital lesson for every believer to learn. God has a special time and God has a special way to accomplish his purposes in and through our lives. And he learned God's time and God's way. That's, uh, as I said, a vital lesson. And then he is exiled because he had tried and he failed. He jumped the gun, you might say. He was premature, even though he had a sense that he was God's deliverer. That was right, but he was premature. The timing was off. The way was off. And so he tried and he failed, and he sent into exile. At 40 years of age. Now, if you're a man and you're around that age, or if you can remember when you were that age, you know that then you're at the height. You're in the prime of your life at, at 40 years of age. That was about when I got here. And you know, the fact of the matter is, he was exiled to what is called the backside of the desert. He's exiled to the backside of the desert, and he is a shepherd of sheep, uh, a stinking flock of sheep, for 40 years. Now he's 80. Now he's 80, and during those 40 years, he's learning about God's time and God's way. And so God shows up unexpectedly one day, at least in an unexpected way, in a bush that was aflame but wouldn't con would not be consumed. And at that burning bush, as we call it, he is recalled by the Lord into service. He is recommissioned as Israel's deliverer. And, of course, at first he's very reluctant to agree to it. But when he does and goes back to Egypt and stands before the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, there is established one of the most dramatic conflicts, listen to me, not between Moses and the king of Egypt, but between God and Satan. Because actually what happened is each of those nine plagues that God brought upon the nation of Egypt, each one of them was against a specific God of the Egyptians that eventually overwhelmed the king of Egypt, overwhelmed the king's will because of the mighty display of God's glorious power resulting in Israel's release and Israel's redemption out of bondage, which I think you've already made the connection as a believer, is a tremendous picture, the Bible pictures it for us, of the believer's release, of the believer's redemption from their spiritual bondage through the cross of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the death of the Son of God is our means of release and redemption from spiritual slavery. Jesus said it himself, every person that commits sin is a slave of sin. And everyone has committed sin, and everyone does commit sin. So we need to be set free and released from bondage. And Jesus is the liberator. That's the Passover. It's, it includes irony, but it really ends in victory. The second event in the book of Exodus is the Red Sea. Passover is Israel's exodus out of Egypt. The Red Sea is Israel's crossing into the desert. And I had you read with me 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm not asking you to turn back there, but I did want to point out in the beginning of that uh, reading, Paul says he doesn't want us to be ignorant how that uh, the patriarchs, our fathers, were under the cloud, he says, 
and all passed through the sea, meaning the Red Sea, talking about the Israel, the, the a nation of Israel passing through, crossing the Red Sea. And here's what he says in verse two. And were all baptized. The whole nation was baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So the Red Sea, Israel's crossing of the Red Sea really is a picture of the nation's unity. According to 1 Corinthians 10, 2, they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were a disorganized mob that uh, were formed into a unit, formed into one body with the deliverer, Moses. And they become followers of Moses, which is a significant picture. It indicates uh, their crossing of the Red Sea is an indication of a complete break with their past life of bondage. It's pictured in that. It's a beautiful reflection, I think, of the believer and their salvation. But before I go there, I wanted to read this. Someone said they had to get across the Red Sea in one night. Now listen to this. If they went on a narrow path, double file, there's three and a half million of them, by the way, approximately. Three and a half million. If they went across the Red Sea in one night, in a narrow path, double file, the line would be 800 miles long and would require 35 days and nights to complete the crossing. So to get it over in one night, there had to be a space in the Red Sea three miles wide so that they could walk 5,000 abreast. Isn't that amazing? The Red Sea crossing was a miraculous event. It, it wasn't uh, anything less than that when you think about what it took. But it, it, as I said, it indicates Israel's complete break with their Egyptian bondage. Beautiful reflection of the believer. Because prior to salvation, as people, we are struggling through life. And then we come into a saving experience with Messiah, who is our Passover, who is sacrificed for us. He is our Passover lamb, sacrificed for us. And then we follow him as our deliverer. And in doing so, we're burning the bridges of our past life. We're burning those bridges behind us, and we're moving forward following Christ, our deliverer, our Moses, you might say, our deliverer as part of his body, because at salvation, we are baptized not by the waters of the Red Sea, so to speak, but we are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit of God. It's a wonderful picture. The crossing of the Red Sea. It's first of all a picture of unity. But I think also the Israel crossing of the Red Sea is a picture of dependency. Here's what I mean. They emerge from that Red Sea, and in the next chapter 15, they're singing. They are singing. You know, you don't have any record of them singing any songs while they were in bondage in Egypt. There's no song in bondage. But when real deliverance takes place, their hearts are just filled with the Lord and filled with joy. And now God dwells among them. He appears as a, a cloud, a cloudy pillar during the day and a fiery pillar at night. He manifests his miraculous presence among them. He dwells among them in that way to lead them every step of the way. What a picture of the believing life. They get to a particular place and they are desperately thirsty, three and a half million of them. Let me just uh, read what is said about uh, quenching their thirst. According to the U.S. Army's quartermaster general, it says uh, that... Uh, in order to give them drink, 
if they only had enough to drink and wash a few dishes, not to bathe in, it would take 11 million gallons each day, enough to fill a train of tanker cars 1,800 miles long. That's how much water for one day it would have t- taken to make these people satisfied with just a drink of water. And yet God brings them to this, to this place where there is an oasis in the desert, and they're so thirsty. It's the desert. They're so hot and thirsty. And they go to drink, and the, the water is poison. It's bitter. They began to cry. They began to complain. God, uh, Moses goes to God, and God says, take this, uh, this uh, stick and put it in the water. And when Moses put that wood in the water, it made the water uh, potable so that they could drink it. It was sweet. That's what the Bible calls it. In other words, they were able to satisfy their thirst. And, and, and again, what a, what a picture how the Lord can sweeten bitterness in a believer's life. And then they go from there and God uh, provides them the manna. Uh, they were hungry. And so God provides three and a half million people daily bread. And this same quartermaster general of the U.S. Army, he said Moses would need 15 tons of food a day, filling two freight trains each a mile long. Besides, you have to remember they were cooking the food, not to mention uh, keeping warm from the cold uh, desert night. So just for cooking, that would take 4,000 tons of firewood and a few more freight trains each a mile long. And this is only for one day. And they were in transit for 40 years. God's provision. Hey, if God can do that, your little measly portion that you need God to provide, you think that's a problem? Put it in perspective, folks. God provided for this many people every day for 40 years. Think he can take care of your measly need? Think so. And then in chapter 17, they come across the the children of Amalek. And there's a battle. Remember, and Moses goes up on a hill. And uh, he it, God tells him to hold his rod up, keep his hands up, hold his rod up. And while Moses' hand with the rod was held high, the Israelites prevailed. But when his arms got heavy and began to, to lag, then the enemy. And I was thinking about that when I was reading that passage a, a few days ago. I was thinking, okay, so Moses is up on a hill holding a piece of wood. And as long as his hands were up outstretched with that wood victory. And it reminded me of Skull Hill. <laughs> That's Golgotha and outstretched arms, and a piece of wood. And there is our victory. And so there is quite an illustration here of dependency. Victory over our enemies. It's by a crucified, risen Christ that we have the power over our spiritual enemies. And then the third event that's significant, I think, in the book of Exodus, of course, is the giving of the Torah. Israel's getting the law of God. There's a couple of things about that. I believe that when God gave Israel the law at Mount Sinai, I think that that signifies the nation's official birth. I think that the law, if I could just make an analogy, it's not the same, but similar to our Constitution. That was the nation's Constitution. 
um, it wasn't a, a, a uh, democratic republic or constitutional republic like, like the United States of America is supposed to be, but it was a theocracy. God was king. And this was the law. Scholars say that uh, the Constitution, the law that God gave to, uh, uh, to Moses for the children of Israel was fashioned after the ancient uh, treaties that were made between a king that conquered another king and his people. And the, the conquering king was called the suzerain. And the conquered king and his people, they were called the vassal, the vassal king and the suzerain king. And uh, the, the giving of a law that is really structured as a suzerain vassal treaty, as it's called in, in ancient Near East, the book of Deuteronomy is structured just like that. So God took that which was knowable and, and, and understandable in that day. And he said, okay, I'm going to make a suzerain vassal treaty with you. I'm the great king. And uh, you guys are the lesser king. And Moses is the lesser king. And you people are my subjects. What's significant about that is that at the very heart, at the very heart of the that kind of a treaty, two things were important. Number one, love. And number two, loyalty. Love and loyalty. Here's how it worked. As long as the vassal people, the vassal king and his people would uh, agree to love and be loyal to the greater king, they'd have his protection. He would protect them. He would uh, see that their needs would be met. And so that's what that's what the law really stands for. It stands for loyalty, which, of course, a loving loyalty, we might say. It's known that the law of God, the Torah, is really a revelation of God's holy character. You know what's good about that? If the law reveals God's character, then we know that nothing can change God. He's the same. And so... You don't have to worry. He's, he's always going to be who he is. His character is unchanging. And the law is a reflection of that. You can be loyal because you can trust a God that's unchanging. I am the Lord God. I change not, he says in Malachi 3. Not only that, I'm convinced as a result of my study that not only was this the official birth of the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai when God gave the Torah, but was actually a marriage covenant between God and Israel. And that that smoke, that cloud that enveloped uh, the top of Mount Sinai was the hoopah. It was the canopy under which the vows were given. And they said, I do. Remember, they said, yes, everything that you say, we will do. They said, I do to God. And he became the husband that we heard about the, this morning in the Haftarah. And they became his wife. Israel became the wife of Yahweh. Interesting. And so it was a manifestation of a loving loyalty to God and God's loving loyalty to them that he seeks to protect the marriage, and he wanted them to do the same. God never changes. He'll always love his own. We're called the bride of Christ. There's coming a day when believers will be invited by Jesus into what is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll sit down at the table no longer as the bride of Christ, but now we'll be wed with him. Right now, spiritually, we are joined to Christ. The moment you're saved, your human spirit is joined to the spirit of Christ. You're one with him already. We're one body. Loyalty. The giving of Israel's Torah. But it's also glory. 
while the Torah was totally glorious, it actually points to a better new and living law. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2, here's what Paul says. You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the letter of Messiah, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart, he says, who also hath made us ministers of the New Testament, New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The law that was given at Mount Sinai was graven in tables of stone, the Bible says, by the finger of God. Amazing. I wonder if that has anything to do with Jesus stooping down when he was in the temple and the stones of the temple, and he's writing in John 11 on those stones, whatever he wrote when those men just disappeared, having brought before him that woman taken in, a, in adultery. We have the law, God's law, the law of Messiah, we have it uh, inscribed in the soft tables of the human soul, which we read there in 2 Corinthians 3 as the result of the Holy Spirit regenerating formerly dead human spirits and then permanently residing in them. Amazing. The law, loyalty and glory. And then the fourth and the final significant ev uh, event in the book of Exodus is the giving of the tabernacle and the construction of it, Israel's tabernacle. And there are two things that I wanted to uh, bring up about it. First of all, just the strategy that uh, goes with the tabernacle. It was the construction. I like to think of the tabernacle as the construction of the king's desert palace, the king being God himself. It's the, it's the king's desert palace and all the furnishings that went with it. And it was very clearly designed by God. Repeatedly, you'll find in the book of Exodus regarding the construction of the tabernacle, make it, be sure that you make it according to the plan that uh, you were given in the mount. This is spoken to Moses. You know, since humanity's creation, God has purposed, I mean purposed, to permanently dwell and fellowship together with, with uh, human beings. In uh, the 25th chapter of the book of Exodus, I was reading this the other day, listen to verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary. This is the tabernacle he's talking about. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. I'm the king. I want to, I've been estranged from uh, humanity. I want to come back. Uh, I had to leave the Garden of Eden, but I want to come back to earth. I want to dwell among humanity. So build me a, a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then in that same 25th chapter, in verse 22, uh, Jesus says, regarding the Ark of the Covenant that had a solid gold lid that was also called the mercy seat, where that Shekinah glory of God would hover over in the Holy of Holies, he says, there I will meet with thee, I will commune with you, I'm going to talk to you there, I'm going to... Uh, Meet and commune with you from above the mercy seat between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony. So here's the strategy I'm talking about. It's a strategic act in the, in the pattern and in the construction, then according to that pattern of the tabernacle, it is a strategic move on the part of God to dwell among and to have continual fellowship with people, with human beings. And here, through Israel, 
the tabernacle is really, I like to look at it this way. It, it's another, it, it's another step to reestablish that Edenic arrangement, the arrangement that he had in the Garden of Eden when he walked with Adam in the cool of the day and they communed together. They had fellowship together. This is another step in bringing himself back in to dwell with man. You know, there were tents, Israel, Israeli tents all around on each of the four sides of the tent called the tabernacle. But the thing that distinguished this tent more than anything else, that is the tabernacle tent, was the presence of God was there. God was dwelling among his people in that locale, in that spot. All the ritual that went along with the tabernacle, all the furnishings, all of that was just illustrating the way for man to enjoy a relationship with God and fellowship with him. That's what it's about. That's what God's up to. That's his strategy that's uh, part of the tabernacle event. But there's a second thing, and that is this, that the tabernacle, while that strategy to dwell and to have fellowship with mankind, yes, that's what he's doing, but that's not good enough for God. There's a reality that uh, he has in mind when he sets up this strategy, and that is represented in the fact that in the New Testament, the believer's body, well, the human body is referred to as a tent. Did you know that? is referred to as a tent, it's called a tabernacle, and later on it's called a temple of God. That's the reality that the tabernacle really represents. Because that tabernacle, that tent was special. It was God's palace. It was God's house. But now God's house is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what 1 Corinthians 3.16 says. Now God's house is the individual believer. Your body becomes the tabernacle or the temple of God. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19. That's what it says. That's the reality. Did you know, and I'm sure you do, that the tabernacle had three parts, mainly, right? It had an outer part called a courtyard. And then when you when the, the priests and Levites, when they went past the first curtain, they were in the sanctuary area. And then behind that area, there was a, another curtain, a second curtain. And that divided the sanctuary from the most holy place, right? The Holy of Holies. And the only piece of furniture in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant where God manifested his presence among the people. Did you know that your human tent, your human body really is three parts? The body is like the courtyard. <laughs> your soul is like the most holy place. Your soul is made up of your, your mind, your thinking, your affections, what affects you, and uh, your will your choices, your decisions. So your soul is the place where you, you, have, uh, you have human recognition, human consciousness. You, you, you can relate to human life and other human beings. But the third and most sacred area in human beings is the spirit of man. And it is in the human spirit where when a person is saved, the Holy Spirit of God himself moves in and resides. So the human spirit is totally saved because that's where God dwells. There's no sin in the human spirit. And so that's the place where God works out from. And he's seeking from the human spirit where he resides, where we become some type of partaker of the divine nature itself where he works out from to bring his saving power over our soul 
and our body. And so the believer is the reality, really, of God's desire to both dwell with and to fellowship with human beings. So Exodus, Exodus is really all about the relationship that God wants with you. That's what it's about. He wants a redemptive relationship with, with human beings. Maybe you know some things about God, but do you have a real personal relationship with God? I mean, be honest. Come on. Be honest about this. Do you have a real personal relationship with God? Do you just come to church to socialize, or do you come to be nurtured in your relationship with God? And by the way, how would you describe your current relationship with God? Or can I ask you this? What do you think it takes for a human being to have a relationship with God, to establish it? And then if you have that answered correctly, I would ask you this. What do you think it would take to improve your personal relationship with the Lord? Well, we have an amazing God. And the whole, as uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, all of these Old Testament uh, stories, accounts, are really, uh, they're examples for us. Uh, it's God's way of communicating and illustrating wonderful truth like we just touched on, just touched the surface of. This is what the book of Exodus, God wants a relationship with you, and you need a relationship with him. Because if you don't have a personal saving relationship with him, you're lost. You can come to Bethel week after week. But if you don't have a, a personal relationship with him, you are lost and you don't have eternal life. And so it's vitally important that you listen up and that you take care of this most important thing in all of life. Because when you stand before the Lord, if he should ask you this question, why should I let you into my heaven? And you say, well, I went to Bethel every week. That's not going to cut it. The answer and the only right answer is, I don't have any right to enter heaven because I am a guilty sinner. But Jesus, he paid my sin debt and took my guilt from me. And my only hope is, that I am depending upon him. I've transferred my dependence from everything else to Jesus alone. And the Lord said, come in. You're my child. You have a real relationship. But your relationship perhaps needs to improve today. And you need to take some personal steps to improve your relationship with God. And who wouldn't when you see this kind of stuff? When you see the length that God goes to, to want to dwell with you and to want to have a relationship with you, the God of heaven steps down to this sinful earth in the form of a man, bears the, the cruel treatment, blasphemous treatment from cursors and blasphemers and hangs as an innocent one for the guilty. And you don't want a relationship with him, or you want to you want to slap him in the face. You want to insult him and say, "I can I can do it my way." <laughs> if you do, you'll join others that that sing, "I did it my way." You'll join them where they are. And it's not a good place.